Like if they don't agree with you, they don't resonate with your ideas, they're gonna be a shitty client anyway. I thought I was like having a heart attack, like for sure. So what are maybe steps one, two, three that we absolutely need to consider right now? Why would somebody invest in what I'm offering? That is what will take your course from being the commodity to a brand. That's the key. Oh, really? Good to know. <laughs> and then she found out about Taco the Cat and she's like, <laughs> That was the end of that. I have so many follow-up questions. Me too. Hey, creators. It's your hosts, Natalie and Yasmin, and you're listening to the Course Creation Podcast. We'll talk business, building digital empires, and how to create passive income to start living a life you love. We are here to empower those of you who are thinking of starting your own course and to support those who are already well on their way to success. We've built a seven-figure media agency on unique storytelling, and now we're here to share our story in the course creation world, and more importantly, to hear yours. We are committed to creating a space for learning and a space for diversity and inclusion. Now let's get the show started. Three, two, one, action. Hello, Mike. Mike Moll from Social Media House. Thanks for joining us today from sunny Mexico. Absolute pleasure. Um, it is sunny here. Actually, funny, I was, someone was questioning me earlier about why I was wearing a sweater. And after you've been here for long enough, if it's only like 27 out, you're like, ah, I can just leave it on. It's fine. What it's a problem so to have. Body, I know. It's so funny how your body adapts. <laughs> Mike Mole, you're a social media and marketing wizard. It is always such a pleasure speaking with you because you're always a wealth of knowledge and you've got some amazing tricks and tips, tips and tricks up your sleeve. And I'm personally really excited to see what we're going to uncover today. You are a brand builder. Um, and you do a lot of online marketing and I feel like anyone who is going into the world of selling anything online, whether it be a course or a product, uh, you need to be able to market yourself. So I guess where we should get started is, um, I would love to know how you got into this. Like, how did you get into this world, your background, your history? Yeah, absolutely. It was a weird, weird, weird story with a, a very peculiar twist and turn. Um, I actually went to school, I went to university for one year. Uh, it didn't go particularly well. I'm not much of a book learner, as I found out. I knew, I knew, but I tried to do it anyway. But uh, Laurier kind of asked, suggested that I didn't come back. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I was, in, I was in sales for a long time. I've always had like little entrepreneurial um, ventures and, and I've always kind of made my own money. And then I kind of had this in my early 20s, I had this like freak out and I was like, no, I have to have a big kid job. I got to go work for a corporation and do the, th and I, I had no idea what it was going to be. Um, so I dove right in. I actually went into insurance. I was in insurance for six years um, and it was like, I, I had no idea. But the thing was like, I, I was a little bit paranoid because I didn't have the education or the, you know, the piece of paper. So I was like, oh, okay, well nobody would hire me. So I, it was more out of like fear. I just went into it. I got offered a job at a salary and I was like, eh, guaranteed money. Why not? Let's do it. And I was there for six years. I bounced around. I kind of kept moving up and up and up. And one day I was, I was, I think I was 27 at the time. I was sitting out in the parking lot, just ready to go into the office. And I reached for the car door handle and my entire body started trembling. And I had, I thought I was like having a heart attack, like for sure. And, um, you know, I froze. I had no idea what it was. I had no idea what to do. So I kind of stepped back. Uh, I stayed in the car for about an hour and a half and I called a bunch of people and just explained what was going on, try to get, figure out some semblance, semblance of an answer. And the, the consensus was, you know, you're obviously not happy and you're obviously, there's some, something going on. So, you know, find another job and th then quit and then move on and, I was like, you know, that is the responsible thing. That's 100% the right answer. And the moment I stepped out of the car, I knew it was the wrong answer. And so I walked in and I quit on the spot and I never looked back. <laughs> so how it got me to the marketing side is, uh, you know, three weeks later, I was sitting on the back porch of my house and I came up with this idea that I was going to start a software company. No idea where it came from. I had no experience and no expertise in it. I just thought, what the hell, let's do it. So I did. I jumped in with two business partners. We tried to make the grocery shopping robot that was going to change the world. It didn't change the world, but we learned a lot of lessons along the way. 
And while we were doing that, as you know, as that was su sucking up a lot of money in development, we were obviously running out of cash because it was a bootstrap company, and I brought you know hundred thousand dollars to the table and hoped for the best. And as we were kind of burning through money, we decided we needed to make money to survive to keep this this product going. And so I went onto YouTube. I taught myself how to use Google Ads, and uh, that's it. We started offering Google Ad services after spending about six hours watching demo videos on YouTube. That's that's kind of where it started. Wow! And how long ago was that? seven and a bit years ago now. That's amazing. So you could say that for the past seven years, you've been, you know, a marketing. Guru. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I think there's some benefits to me being fully self taught, because I, I feel like there was no rules for me because I didn't know what the rules were. And so I, I, I kind of just did whatever I wanted. And I think that like creative flexibility and the flexibility of just kind of you know, looking at things in a really pragmatic, logical way, I think has really helped me learn how to market because if you go to a big agency, they demand a big budget for all these pieces of creative and all these different you know, streams of input. And sometimes it's just a question of, well, what's going to make people buy stuff? You know, and I only, I only saw it from that. And that was kind of, so it was like a really lean psychology and I kind of tried to do everything as efficiently as possible and I think that really benefited me in my learning and, and since then I've spent you know just under just under two and a half million dollars personally on Facebook and Google Ads so I've really seen the gamut of you know different industries and how different budgets work and, and you know for different products and services so it's been a really interesting experience. Yeah that's that's really amazing and and Mike, it's so relevant to exactly what we're doing today. You know, we've owned our media agency for the past decade and we're constantly pivoting, shifting, you know, figuring out the next step. And here we are, we are, we want to be able to um, grow a global community, so to speak, and offer our online courses. And we're starting off with our video editing course 101, um, how to learn Premiere uh, Pro. You know, we're sort of trying to figure it out ourselves and how do we promote how do we promote us? How do we promote our online course? And what are some of the first actions that we need to be considering in these early stages? So what are maybe steps one, two, three that we absolutely need to consider right now? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So the key is to not buy ads yet. <laughs> um, okay. I think a lot of people think, a lot of people think, okay, I've launched this thing. Now I got to get the ad campaign going. But the truth about ads in any context is, is there's a lot of learning that has to happen and there's a lot of finding your audience that has to happen for a course to make sense. And because any product or service, whether it's an editing course or a, you know, a, a renovation business, it, it doesn't really matter. The point is there's huge variance in like what the price points are, what the quality can be, right? There's so many companies doing di these different things. So, you know, you may have a course that's amazing that really gets people to the next level and you've got it priced up here. But if you're buying Google ads, you know, Udemy is buying ads for its $15 course and you don't want to compete with that. So there's so much learning and there's so many variables that come with buying ads at the beginning. I, I highly don't recommend it until you've kind of got the sales process going. So here's where I would start. Um, the number one rule for me in any marketing is give more than you ask. And so what I mean by that is give away information, help other people so you can build trust so that people see you as the people to go to when it comes to anything, you know, uh, video and content and storyboarding and, and, and all those things. So create content that people can understand, that they can take action on, that they can resonate with because taking somebody from I have no idea who you are to buy this learning material for me is a really tricky ask, right? You might have a really slick sales page and it could work, but building that awareness and building that trust um, puts them in an ecosystem where you're the go-to. You gals are the go-to for anything that's to do with, you know, video and that, and that type of stuff, which will bode well for the next round of stuff that you put out. Because if you're the go-to and you make that purchase a no-brainer, it's really easy to sell the next thing or upsell or, or however you want to do. So I would say making content, getting it to people that need it and that can, you know, come to you as the learning platform, I think makes a ton of sense. Well, Mike, it sounds like what you're saying, 
before we even spend any money on advertising, we need to build a community. And the way to build that community is to put out free content, like content that actually gives people value. Is that, is that right? A hundred percent. Yeah. And you can do that in a number of different ways. I think the most powerful way right now is, is Facebook groups. Um, you know, Facebook just spent an obscene amount of money in February trying to get the groups out there, right? They had a Super Bowl ad saying there's a group for everybody. Like they wouldn't do that unless they were going all in on groups. And what I, from what I've seen, I've, I've helped some people like, you know, start or enhance or, or get theirs to the next level. And one thing I'm seeing is the engagement and the amount of visibility of your content through a Facebook group compared to anything else right now is second to none, you know, better than an email list. Um, certainly better than a Facebook page, like a Facebook business page, the, the engagement on those things are a joke. Like you, it's, I think it'd be impossible to build a Facebook page up right now. Um, I think a group is, is hundred percent the way to go. I have so many follow-up questions. Me too. First, first I want to say, you know, when it comes to the course creation world, they all talk about the email list. They keep talking about how it's the most important thing, important marketing tool you can have is build your email list. So putting that out into the universe in this conversation. <laughs> and then the other, so I want you to comment on that and why you think Facebook groups are better. And then the follow-up question to that would be, how do I build, how do I get people to join my Facebook group? Is it just like whatever subject matter I, I'm trying to push forward or do I invite people? Like how do I get people to join? Got it. So I'll start, I'll start at the first question, email list versus Facebook group. 100% email list is important. But building an email list is very challenging. Scaling a Facebook group is a little bit easier. So it's a, you know, we're talking about where to start. To me, that's where to start. You want to have the option of a Facebook or of an email list as well, but making sure that, I apologize for the noise, um, but making sure that uh, you, know, you have something that's easy to get in front of people is going to be your Facebook group. What I would recommend is give the Facebook group kind of access to everybody, you know, Anybody mm -hmm. that wants to learn about this or this or that, we can talk about how to like structure that content. Um, make the email list something that is trickier to get involved with or requires them giving you an email. So what I mean by that is you might have a four minute or a five minute training video that you put into your Facebook group that's like, hey, if you've never heard of this or you, you, know, you don't know how to map content out or you don't know how to you know, optimize your LinkedIn profile, whatever, right? Those little trainings can go on there, but you could then host a webinar to the people that are in the group saying, hey, you know, we're gonna spend 45 minutes and do a deep dive on this subject matter. Sign up for the webinar and then you get in. And then those people who are like ready for next level content who are more serious, they can go on the email list. But, but the, way, the best way to grow an email list just by itself is to run ads to a webinar or a, you know, a cheat sheet or an ebook or something like that. But then you have to run ads and you need to, you know, you're going to get really, really wide with who you have to target to find the right people. So a Facebook group is a good entry level catch all, then move them up to the email list with higher quality content or more access to you or access to a mini, like a webinar. That's like a mini course version of your paid thing. You got to think about it in tiers. And so by tier, I mean, quality and access. That's how you move up tiers. So you give them more access to you or you give them higher quality stuff. And that's not to say like, I think there's a lot of people who are out there that are, you know, the content they put in their Facebook group is so low quality. It's like, Hey, I'm just putting this out for I'm you know, just resharing this or I'm putting out this really generic thing that requires you to go to my webinar to get real value. And then you get to the webinar and you're like, oh, you got to buy this thing to get the real value. And it almost feels like you're being tricked each time. It should be a standalone piece of value, but you don't have to put everything into that one product. So let people move up the ladder, but make sure each piece is a standalone valuable piece and not just saying, well, you need, the, you know, you got to give us your email to get the rest. Mm -hmm. Oh no, now you got to pay us to get the next part. Like make it quality, but make it standalone. Just make it smaller bits. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's one of my questions too. Like, where do you draw the line of, okay, we have enough content that's available. That's a value that's available for free to engage with our audience. And, you know, we, we obviously want to um, have passive income. So, you know, we want to create a great foundation, 
be there to help support and continue that support, but eventually move on to the next course. So how much time do you spend? Is there a formula? Like you start off with three introductory videos of value? Yeah, I think you gotta, I think you gotta work backwards. And this is kind of the step two for me is working backwards from that purchase, right? So who is it that you want to buy this product, right? Is it, is it somebody who's maybe a freelancer who wants to like enhance their skills so they can now offer another service? Is it somebody who is, you know, recently graduated who feels like, Oh, I got to hone my skills so I can actually get a job. Like who is it for? And then what, what motivates them? What would, what would make them interested in buying this thing and then build the content backwards from that. So if you know that if you said, Hey, you know, I want to make sure that people that are want to offer video, so maybe there's freelancers who do graphic design and adding video editing would be like an amazing component for them. So this is, this is who we're going to target. What do they care about as a freelancer, not just a video editor, but what do they care as a freelancer? So you could find, you know, you could find stuff like, you know, different tools and resources that freelancers could use like, like HoneyBook or, you know, different, like different things um, you could find you could interview the people that create the tools and, you know, and pull extract value out of them to feed into them. So the content doesn't have to be all leading into your product. Your content needs to be valuable for who you want to sell to. And as long as you're doing stuff that's making their life easier. So for me, you know, when we were doing a lot of Facebook ad training and Google ad training, it wasn't all just about how to use dynamic creative, how to optimize the bids because the people, that we would be creating those videos for knew how to run ads already. It wasn't helpful for them, but like what would be helpful for them is, you know, what, you know, how to choose, uh, how to choose an image if you're going to run an ad or what are a bunch of stock photo sites that you could use to find creative for an ad. That's stuff that someone who's thinking about ads could use at level one, two, and three. I'm not, you know, so I always think about it like this. You guys have a level 10 of knowledge. A lot of people try and make content that's level eight. Like, okay, if we just, you know, break down our stuff a little bit, then this is going to deliver amazing high quality content. But the people that you're selling to are probably not at that level. Your the level eight content is like other people who are your competitors or people that are already editing video who might get a little bit of value out of this. That's not who you're making content for. You're making content for the person who has, you know, no idea what any of the terminology means. They have no idea what any of it is. So breaking it down in like little bite sized pieces really basic entry level stuff is actually going to be better value if you know you're selling to someone that doesn't have any skill set yet rather than saying well you know, I'm trying to teach them at this level you got to teach them the baby steps because yeah. they're going to get motivated by that because they don't know any of that yet you got to dumb down your knowledge yeah I feel like that's exactly what we're trying to do with this course too it's literally video editing 101 and I would say our t- target demographic is anyone who's looking to create content uh, it's not the editor who just graduated who's trying to get better at it. It's not, you know, it's not um, somebody who's trying to get a job. It's literally like the influencer. It's the it's the person who's literally trying to create content in their home and they don't know how. Um, and so it sounds to me like if I was going to use your method, which is create the Facebook group first and then try to get people's emails from the Facebook group and then, then create them like almost create like a funnel. And I think we should maybe right now we should actually talk about the funnel. Everybody talks about the funnel and I feel like let's acknowledge that. What is the funnel and how does it work? Got it. I think so funnels are necessary. They are very relevant, but they can also be extremely overcomplicated if you choose to go down that path. Um, I know there's people that make that have, you know, multi-million dollar businesses by creating these like, you know, these templates for your funnel and there's like 900 steps and you're like, what in the hell? Like, this is so much, it's so much stuff. And, and a lot of times it can work, but a lot of times it's unnecessary. So your funnel is basically this. You need to put out content that's going to be, that's going to generate more top level awareness, yeah. ass attention. It's going to help a bunch of different people because you don't know how to reach the individual who's passionate about video editing. You might reach the person who's passionate about creating content or about being an influencer or, or that. So you have to appeal to that whole bucket in order to, in order to then say, okay, if I have the thousand people who are interested in content as a whole, maybe there's 200 of them who have a passion for editing 
or interested in getting better at editing, and then maybe 50 people who are willing to actually buy that thing. So at the top, your Facebook group is really the top of funnel. It's your catch-all. You're trying to attract creators because you don't know who's going to care about editing and who's not. So that's a good place to start. To, for me, what I would do for you is your middle of the funnel would be your more in-depth, you know, step-by-step -step tutorials or webinars or whatever that is saying, hey, content creators, if you want to know some of the, like the fundamentals of, you know, transitions or whatever, whatever micro, like small topic about editing inside of that, sign up for this. We're going to do 30 minutes on this thing. And you can record it once and just repeat it. You don't have to do it live every time. Um, but the people that give you their email, who will then spend the 30 minutes watching that, they go to the middle of the funnel because now there's intent. Now it's like, wait, if you're willing to spend 30 minutes learning about this thing, you'd probably buy the course. So that's like the next step of the funnel. And then from there, the people that have given you their email, you know, you entice them via email and say, hey, we'd love for you to try out our course, you know, 100% satisfaction guarantee, what, however you pitch it. And then some of the middle will go to the bottom and actually make a transaction. But it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. I think what people try and do is they try and say, you know, as soon as you get their email, you have to have this system, this labyrinth of like a hundred other emails to like get them interested and get them, you know, engage with you. And like, you can, but you don't really need to. Um, you can just deliver something of really high quality, ask them if they'll make the sale. And if not, then think about what other micro pieces you can keep delivering to them until you've given them enough where they're like, holy crap, I'm going to invest in this thing. I have to, I've, I've got so much knowledge from them already that I have to invest in the course. Um, that's the simplest way to do it by creating, you know, m multiple like webinars and just the people that have opted in, keep giving it to them until they're like, wow, I got to see how this all comes together. That's the easiest way. That's really good advice to kind of break it down because it can be so overwhelming and you know, we hear this is the right way to do it or this is the wrong way to do it or do it this way. It's going to be more successful, but that's a really nice way to a picture, put it on the vision board and just like check it off the list and actually do it without having to spend a whole lot of money or a whole lot of time and resources. So that's awesome. A quick question about the Facebook group. When you talk about obviously the basics of understanding who your target demographic is, um, you know, let's say we're, we're going after the influencers and perhaps maybe there are those um, recent graduates who still want to hone their skills and are thinking that this might still be a great, useful course for them. Do you create one Facebook group for both audiences or separate ones? All one. All one. Okay. The amount of the amount of time and effort and dedication to to make a really high quality Facebook group is not not to be understated. It's not easy, um, and so trying to do multiple when you're still testing, like you. So here's the diff Here's the thing. Until you start. So when people talk about the funnel that works, that's a subjective opinion. Whatever is making transactions happen is the right answer, right? Uh, so I would say. Go based on a thesis, stay very narrow in who you target and how you speak to them and making sure that you're delivering stuff that they will find helpful and then, and then see if they actually buy. You know, you might get a whole bunch of people signing up for a webinar and then they're all just like, cool, thanks, mm -hmm. bye. And they never buy the course. And so then you're like, great, where, where is it breaking down? So you can say, hey, when I reach out to people to join the Facebook group, they seem to do it. It's highly engaged. They seem really interested. When I post about more in-depth content or bigger training, right? More access, more webinars. We get a lot of people that sign up. They come and then they watch the video. Okay, now it's just your pitch at the end sucks, right? If you get a whole bunch of people in the Facebook group and then nobody signs up for a webinar ever, maybe you're pitching the webinar wrong or maybe you don't have the right audience in the group. So you kind of like figure out where the breakpoints are and like, and then you test a thesis, but only test one thing at a time, right? Like if you've got a bunch of people showing up to the webinars and nobody's buying, maybe just test how you ask for the sale. And that's it. Test it in one way versus another way. You split that up and then you get some data. Maybe, you know, being really aggressive, you know, saying that you're going to give a, a deal to the first 50 people that sign up, providing that scarcity is getting people to buy. Maybe it's just saying, I think you'd really like this. And then if one of them's working, 
then just move over. And then if that slows down in its functionality, then test something new, test something new. Are there any um, programs or anything other than like understanding the Facebook analytics and um, looking into that? Is there anything else that's complementary to all of this Facebook uh, greatness? Um, you know, Google analytics is better than Facebook, the Facebook analytics. Um, so if you're sending people to a website to watch the webinar or you're getting people, so Google analytics is going to be way more powerful than Facebook. So I would, I would do both. Um, in fact, the simplest way is to use Google tag manager, um, which essentially is a container for all things analytics. So you put the container on your website and then you put the Google analytics in it. You put the Facebook analytics in it. You put the LinkedIn analytics in it and the container holds all of them. But the nice thing is that you don't, you only need to put it in the one container and the container takes care of everything else. So I encourage you to, you know, use all the different analytics platforms, but Google analytics will give you a way deeper breakdown. And then the other thing is if you're using, um, if you're using a webinar program, it'll tell you how long people stay and where they drop off. If you're just using like a landing page with a video, you know, video embedded in it, make sure you have a, uh, like I think Vimeo does it and there's a bunch of other mm -hmm. ones that track like how long people stay and how long, you know, they engage with the video for to see if it's that, you know, maybe your first five minutes is just boring and people just leave. Right. So, Hey, I'm getting like a hundred people there and like nobody's staying past four minutes. Well, mm -hmm. that's something to do with the content of the video more than it is, you know, getting people there versus we got a bunch of people there and then nobody's watching it. Maybe they thought it was something that it wasn't. So you can tell, you can see the natural breaks. And as you start to get data, it'll become pretty clear. Like, Oh, a lot of people said yes. And then like disappeared. A lot of people said yes, then did this thing and then disappeared. You can figure out where the gaps are. So cool. So again, I want to go back to the, the elusive Facebook group as well, just because <laughs> It's a, uh, it's a really interesting, I, I'm telling you everything in the course creation work is about the email list, um, create, like creating a community, build the em email list. And so the Facebook group is really interesting to me because it's kind of like you are saying that's the first step before we even have the email list. So my question is, um, again, if I'm starting from complete zero from scratch, I have no followers. I have no one interested in what I have to say. Um, let's say I create this overarching Facebook group that's going to, you know, um, talk to a lot of my demographic. Um, how, again, how do I get people to join? Is it, do I just post content of value every single day? Is it like Instagram where I can use hashtags and people find me? Um, or should I connect it to Instagram and then send them to Facebook? What's how, like in a really con like concise, constructive way, how do I get people to join? Absolutely. Okay. So a couple things. Um, Facebook groups, similar to a blog, allows you to tag your posts so that you have categories. This is a key component. So figure out all the things you're going to talk about. And as you create content, you can put it in the, in, the, in the bucket of subject matter. That way, if somebody's new and they want to learn about a specific thing, they know where to go find that content. So that's an advantage that Facebook groups have over just posting it on a page. Once you get the Facebook group to about a hundred people, it will start building on its own because once every couple of weeks, you'll say, you know, Hey everyone, you know, always looking to find more awesome creators. And if you have anybody else, we'd love you to invite them into the group. Now, if I'm part of a group, the nice thing is within the group, there's like a tab on the right. That's like invite and it has all of their friends list. So they can bring fellow creators and other people in by you encouraging them to say, Hey, we're trying to, you know, get as much value out to as many people as possible. Would love you to keep adding your, you know, relevant people to the community. So once you get it to a hundred, you can usually just have that conversation every couple of weeks, get three to five more people in every, every week or so. But to get it at the beginning, if you don't have your own email list, if you don't have your own network, if I just, just got onto Facebook for the first time and I just went on and created a group and I had nothing to work from, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, you can go share the content that you're putting in your group in other groups. So if there's a creator group or, uh, you know, other things about, you know, video or influencer or anything like that, you can go. And if it's valuable standalone content, go post it in those other groups. 
be like, hey, everyone, um, I created this thing. And make sure that whatever that is, end to end, they could just like go through it, take action, get value from it. There's no like, come here to find out the rest. Start dumping it into groups. Because what'll happen is then people will say, oh, well, that's really good. That's really interesting. Then they'll look you up. They'll see that you have this group. And then they'll start finding you by sharing content. So that's like an, that's an easy way. And you can find a whole bunch of these creative groups and just post the same piece in each one and start siphoning attention away from them. The other thing you can do is like really cost effective social listening. So Quora, um, Twitter, if you just do a search for the hashtags, um, you know, if somebody has a question about how do I, you know, does anybody know how to use this or does anybody know how to like create an awesome storyboard? You can then go post and be like, Hey, here's a thought on it. Oh, by the way, we've got this Facebook group, come check it out. And then other people who see that conversation on Twitter or who see your answer on Quora, who are asking the same question, will see the question, see your answer and discover your group. So it's just about getting interjecting into conversations in a non salesy way, but, but just getting yourself out there. And then over time you can like pull back from having to do it. Once the group is growing, it will be self discovering because other people will find it. Other people will talk about it in their other channels. Um, you can tell them to invite cause creatives all hang out with creatives for the most part. So having them bring their crew in, um, is a good way, but just from the start, I would find other groups, share high, share the content in there, and then let them discover you, um, and then find things like Twitter and Quora, and just go like answer questions, but all and say, hey, if you you know if you want to be part of this community, position it as a community rather than like come join the Facebook group. It's mm -hmm. a community of creators. We're working towards you know whatever that thing is, right? We're working towards creating independent revenue working anywhere in the world. And it's like, Oh, that's exciting. Cause that's what, you know, if that's what you're trying to do, you're trying to share your journey, but also share the things that you've learned and give, you know, give back into that community. So I think that's a great way to do it. You know, have the description of the group about that. Cause that's attractive. People want to do that. And you might get somebody that's a little bit further ahead of your journey who comes and joins and then you create content with them and they improve your group. Or there might be people that, you know, have, are just in the beginning stages and don't have the experience of you got, you running a successful business for 10 years, right? Like, you know way more than you think you know. And by dumbing it down and sharing those basic insights, you're going to attract the type of people that will buy a course. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about actually creating valuable content. Um, you know, when we're creating our video editing 101 course, one of the things that we kept grappling with was, is it just going to be a voiceover or are we going to be on camera actually teaching these lessons? Um, and it's like, do we need to be on camera? It's like, you're going to be following us on the screen as we're showing you how to edit. Do you need to see us to relate to us? Does that, is that human component important? What are your thoughts on that? A hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of, of BS information on the internet about creating passive income you just build this system and then it'll start working. Like it takes a lot of work to get it off the ground. Now, once it's off the ground, it becomes a lot easier to maintain. It kind of feeds itself. Yes. But I think having personality that people will resonate with is, is one of the more important things because I can, information is the commodity. I can get the same information you're going to give in a $15 Udemy course. I could probably, if I wanted to piece it together, you know, through these sporadic chain, I could find it on YouTube. I could find it for free if I did the work, right? All the course is, is someone believing that you are the person or you are the team to take them through the best steps to get to the end result. Cause all the information is out there. And if they don't have a belief in you, then they'll go find it somewhere else. You know, that that's, so I do think having the, the personality in the brand is really important. When it comes to engagement with your audience as you're building this audience and you know, you want to be, you want to make sure that they're heard and you're also listening so that you can provide the best, you know, service possible or the best course possible. How much time do you spend on actually communicating with your community and not feeling burnout? Good question. So at the beginning, it's a lot because nobody cares about you. Nobody knows who you are. Um, you know, starting from scratch is, is, is a challenge, right? And so 
you know, you do put, I think I highly recommend at the beginning stages is, is putting yourselves in the driver's seat of it. And then as it builds and as you can get away from it, you can introduce other people into the mix. Here's our, you know, the group moderator and start integrating them into the post. So people get used to them and seeing it, but just to like, have it be like, oh, it's us, and then be like, oh yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not here anymore. Um, we'll throw people off, and I think it can be done. But I think if you're thinking about this as like a long-term play, I think keeping yourself involved in it makes the most sense. The reason I like it is because people either resonate with you or they don't. You don't. The people that don't like you for whatever reason for whatever, you know, so I think about it like this. The reason I like to do um, an in-person discovery call if I'm selling consulting is I want that person to hear my opinion, see that I'm a pushy guy when it comes to marketing. Like if you disagree with me, then go somewhere else. I, that's just how I am because I've done it a lot. I've sent a lot of emails. I spent a lot of money. And if you want lean and effective, great. If you disagree with me, go find someone else who will take your input. That's just how I feel. So I... I put that into my first conversation with someone because I want to know if they agree with it or if they're like, no, no, I, I like somebody who's got more leniency or who, who's more open-minded. Great. There's other people. There's other people that make other courses. So to me, if you don't like me, whether it's my attitude or sometimes it's like, I just don't like how your face looks. Or I don't like the sound of your voice. You know, there, you, there is that natural bias where um, sometimes you just don't like people because of the sound of their voice and it's not right. It doesn't make any sense, but it happens. You know, you know, you in a group at a party, you're just like, you know, really didn't like Kelly. Why not? I don't know. just didn't like her. Like it happens. <laughs> so I like to put my face out in front of it so that if someone doesn't get a good feeling with me, that they just stop right away. Because the worst thing that can happen is say on the back end of your course, you want to have a, a, you know, a creator mastermind or you want to have bigger events or bigger ticket. They want to give access to you for strategy for all this stuff. Like if they don't agree with you, they don't resonate with your ideas, they're going to be a shitty client anyway, right? So I like to get in front of it, let people who feel a good connection with me keep going, let the people that don't move on right from the get-go um, so that it, I think it will save you a lot of heartache because mm -hmm. the people that don't resonate and don't connect with you, they're going to be the person that emails like every week, I don't understand this thing, I don't know how this works. And like they're going to need so much hand-holding, it's going to be a nightmare. Yeah, just I because they can. I also feel like that kind of ties in really well with like imposter syndrome. Like if I could tie it to that category, I would say that, you know, we are dealing with imposter syndrome in the sense that there are so many video editing courses out there that already exist. And why would anyone buy our course? Why would anyone want to listen to us? But I think that's it, right? It's that human connection. It's seeing us on screen. Someone's going to want to learn from me personally. Um, and not Joe Schmo out on the internet. So yeah, I think my question, the question that I'm leaning into is how do you deal with imposter syndrome? How do you not look at everything that's available out there on the internet and not think to yourself, why would somebody invest in what I'm offering? Uh, my recommendation, and it's tricky to do, is just, you know, in the, you know at the horse races when they put those little flaps on the blinders? Yeah. Literally just permanent blinders. So there's, there's, there's a, an ego element and then there's a logical element. So let's look at the ego element first. Um, I know how much time that I've spent in this craft. So I have the audacity to say I'm an expert. If you spend as much money and you've worked with as many campaigns as I have, I'm an expert now and you are experts. Now I think the imposter syndrome comes when it's the people that like, okay, I'll just like watch these couple of videos and I'm going to make a course about it. Like, no, you've been in the trenches. You've seen every mistake that you can make. You've had every customer nightmare that you could ever see. You've been through it all. If you've been in business for five years, you've seen it all, right? So, so that's a good, like from the ego side, you are an expert. And if people resonate with you and the way that you say it, then that's it. Imposter syndrome completely kicked out. Um, I think from the other side, when it comes to the reason I say blinders from the logistical standpoint is this because I've been selling, I know my numbers. And if you know your numbers, you can reverse engineer and it becomes a lot less daunting. So if you say I need a thousand people in my group, my Facebook group or 
say 100, just for the simple math. I need 100 people in my Facebook group and 10% of them, so 10 of them will come to a webinar and then one of the people that come into our like email list webinar will buy the course. So once you've done this enough, once you've put through six to eight months of this and you know those numbers, then you can say, okay, if I need, if I need 100 people to buy my course in total for me to be successful with it, that means I need 1,000 people to come onto my webinar, right? Which means I need 10,000 people in my Facebook group. So go get those 10,000 and that's it. That's it. It's a numbers game. So when you understand your numbers of like how many come through which channel to end up with a sale, figure out how many sales you want and then reverse that. And if you say, okay, I need to spend five hours a week and I can get 20 people in my Facebook group. Well, how fast do you want that thousand customers? Mm -hmm. If you want them more then put in a hundred hours a week and get it faster. Right? So once you've actually gone through some of the process and worked at the kinks, of like where you're losing people, it just becomes a numbers game of how many people do I need to reach out to and communicate with to end up with those sales. And it works the same way in, in as a service-based company, as a course, it's all the same thing. Um, you will have numbers and there will be things you can do to improve the numbers, granted, and you'll learn those things by getting customer feedback. You know, you talk to the webinar people, hey, why, why, won't, why didn't you buy this? Oh, I just felt like it was too pushy. I just didn't see how the webinar content connected to the course. So I didn't see the value, right? You learn that stuff and you're like, oh, okay, then we need the webinars to talk about this instead of that. And you'll fix those processes. But after you get a couple months in, if you go hard on building that initial community and then moving them up, you'll learn how many people you need to talk to. And then you won't care who your competitors are, right? If all I need to do is get 10,000 people out of the tens of millions of cr content creators in North America, who gives a shit about everybody else? They don't make, they don't matter. If I got my 10,000, I can make my hundred thousand dollars a year in my course and I'm done. So that's why I don't think about it. I know my numbers and I know what I need to make. Um, and as long as I can do that and there's not so much competition that it's stopping me from achieving that, I couldn't care less. That's really, really great advice. And I think I'd like to shift gears now and maybe focus a little bit on pricing. I think that, you know, as first time, um, course creators. I mean, again, we've been in business for so long and we always put the value, we always pricing based on, you know, time spent, the value, the resources, all that good stuff. But it's really easy to take a look at all of these platforms that are available to content creators or course creators like Udemy, you know, Thinkific, whatever. There's just so many of them. And it's easy to say there's already users. People know about these platforms, you know, put up your course. It costs $10 on promo. Maybe you sell it for $200 depending on, you know, the make of that specific platform and how you can utilize it. But essentially, you know, are we selling ourselves short by going on those platforms when we know that we have a course that is of great value and it could be sold for more? Um, should we still go ahead and, and use that as a strategy to begin with? Or should we just nix that and host it on our own website? You, you can do anything you like. <laughs> uh, so here's my advice. Um, the reason I say community, the reason I say building community that you're the forefront of where you are the value providers, the value curators. You don't have to make all the value. You can get content from, you know, you could reach out and say, Hey Mike, I love you to make something that's an exclusive for our group. Can we interview you live or can we, you know, you can have other, you should get other experts to come in and share there cause you don't know everything. Right. Um, so I, you know, being the curator, being the front end of, of, Hey, I'm going to build this community where you can, learn and build from each other, learn and build from us. Um, that is what will take your course from being the commodity to a brand. That's the key. So all this stuff leads into what you're allowed to charge, right? If you're, if you're running a Facebook ad, that's like, Hey, do you want to learn how to, you know, run ads? And you're like, cool. The course is $1,900. And you'd be like, I'm not paying that. Mm -hmm. But if the course is $55, they'll be like, okay, I can do it. Cause that threshold for like, I'm just buying a commodity from a Facebook ad that I saw is like an, it's a quick transaction, but you can, you know, what is your threshold to get away with? You know, if you've got a good sales page and you show that you're really credible, maybe 250 bucks. But if you're going to sell it from an ad with no brand, no commodity, like if you're just putting it out there as a commodity, then that's going to command a lower price. When you build an audience and when you do the extra mile stuff, um, that's where you can command a higher price for it. 
So you can sell it for cheaper. Like I know people that sell it for like sell courses for like 1500 on their website and like 87 on Udemy and they get scale out of Udemy. But if you come to it from, if you, and here's the thing, some people will be like, Oh, I saw it on Udemy and now I'm seeing it here. Why would I buy that? You're like, you wouldn't go buy it on Udemy. And you're gonna, that's, what, that's how it's gonna go. So you can sell it at different prices at the same time because it's a different platform, a different ecosystem. I don't see any harm in that because you're, you're scaling to the market. And if you think doing it to get audience, getting an email list out of the people that bought it, because you're gonna roll out more and more and more courses and more materials and more access to yourselves, then that might be part of your strategy. So it's not bad to do that. Um, but if this is like, hey, this is the only program we're gonna record in the next 18 months and this is gonna be our revenue driver, then it's gonna be a really hard to sell to get it on Udemy because you would need such scale after they take their fee to make it work. So then, okay, now I, then that means I wanna sell it for two grand or whatever. Um, so I better build the community so I can get, because here's the difference, right? How many people do you need to buy it at 50 bucks to equal one sale at 2,000? And then it's less customer service. It's less, you know what I mean? So both ways work. Um, but thinking about what your big picture is for the business as an info product business is a key factor. So you got to think about it like that is, you know, where are you going to make your money and can you get scale? So you could test it on Udemy and see, you know, maybe it blows up and those, you know, that $32 transaction over and over thousands of times makes sense for you. But if it doesn't, maybe you pull the plug or maybe you put it on there and have it on your own website and have it at two drastically different prices and see where you can get sales from and then kill the other thing. There's no harm in testing. That's great. That's really great advice. Um, yeah, we're definitely grappling with that. I think we mentioned to you the last time we spoke that we were thinking of launching on Udemy just to test it out and just to see you know, where it will go and get feedback and go from there. Um, and there's so much information out there and it's like, there are a lot of course creators and, um, marketing experts who say, don't launch on Udemy. You have to have your own platform. You have to have your own lawn launching funnel and so on and so forth. So I, I really love your approach of just, you know, take it easy, like test it, see, see what happens. Um, so yeah. Where do we even go from here? You just offloaded so much wisdom and so much knowledge. I want to keep talking to you because I feel like you're giving us so much amazing uh, tidbits of wisdom. Um, I just feel like, you know, okay, so you're, you're a course creator. You, you think you have something to offer. You've created your Facebook group. You've gotten some emails. You've launched, right? And, and now it's time to talk about advertising, I think, right? Wouldn't that be the natural next step? Yep. Unless, unless building that group is doing all the advertising you need. Right. I think it goes back to like, what do I actually need out of this? And so if you have lower ticket, so the more clients you have, the more work it's going to be, the more questions, the more, what, you know what I mean? So scaling isn't always the best thing. You may want the perfect 500 clients that are going to keep buying the next product you're pumping out and you're going to do, you know, advanced storyboarding and like, you know, you guys have so much knowledge that you could package up all these different products. So do you need the perfect thousand customers or do you want this at scale? That's going to dictate what you need to do because so here's my, this is what I would think about for yourself. And I think this is probably a better way for you to go. The webinar style content, the like micro courses, I would create those for you to me to build your email list. So a 45 minute course on like the intro to like this. Now editing's a little bit different because obviously, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a longer process, but there's storytelling stuff, there's filming stuff, there's, I mean, there's so many different facets in that ecosystem. So if you wanna advertise, what I would do is create smaller things, whether they're actually like courses or just as like webinars, or you just, you two having a conversation about the step-by-step -step and like letting people be a fly on the wall in that conversation. I've seen that work as a webinar, right? Um, I would create that. And if you're going to advertise, you advertise that stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got to get attention and then you got to get people to like you. And then you got to have something that actually delivers on the back end. So 
Um, I think, I think the key is starting to execute without ads, figuring out where your passion and joy is. Cause what you may find is the creator, the people that are in the Facebook group, you might, you know, interview somebody or you guys might come up with some fun concepts to share and people might say, yeah, you know, I don't care about editing, but if you guys did a workshop on, you know, how to, you know, how to plan a shoot day or whatever. Cause I, I really want to start offering that as a service, but I have no idea how cool there's 10 spots at a hundred bucks a spot. And all of a sudden you have a thousand dollars for a one hour webinar that exists because you have a community and you've been giving them value. So, you know, you, I don't think you know what that thing is going to be yet. So I think experimenting without ads because ads are cumbersome and they're challenging. And I think really realistically, um, right now we have our business at a half million dollars without ads. It's just all organic. It's just all outreach, That's right? Amazing. It's just building relationships mm -hmm. and being helpful. Like I did this consulting thing and I landed, like I'm probably just from doing 30 minutes of free consulting just to give back as a way to help. No ask, no obligation to do, you know, we, we talked, right? I didn't say like, come buy something from mm -hmm. me. I'm just like, here, here are some good ideas. Go, go for it. You know, I'm going to probably make 30,000 in consulting just on the back end of like, wow, I want you to take this to the next level. Or actually my friend could use your help. What's your price? Like it just happens. So mm -hmm. creating content being, and just getting it out there and like getting the wheels in motion is, is often all you need. And then if you find something where you're like this Facebook group or these webinars or these things are, are the things that's driving our revenue, then maybe think about how you could run ads against that. Um, and then if you do, it's Facebook ads, Facebook and Instagram ads are the best. But if you ran a 30 minute webinar as a Facebook ad on like, here's the basics to like this, to here's one section of it. And they're like, wow, this is amazing. Then you're like, cool. Do you want the rest? Or like, do you want to learn how to do all this stuff? Come by the course. So you can actually have a 30 minute ad that's teaching them a module of your program for them to be like, this has given me enough value to come buy something from you. So Facebook and Instagram ads, if you're going to do ads. Um, but I think most people don't need to do them. I think they need to do outreach and they need to scale themselves out and they need to build a community first. The only other scenario where I think ads is if you said, you know, I don't have the bandwidth and the time to do a Facebook group. I'm not into it. I don't want to do it. Then you kind of need to run ads to build your email list. And so what I would do is I would run ads that say, Hey, do you want to learn, you know, do you want to learn the perfect X, Y, Z? We've got this 30 minute video training. Uh, if you sign up for it, so they're like, oh yeah, I do want to learn that. They sign up for it. They give you their email to get access to the video content. And then you have their email and then you sequence out, you know, some more helpful stuff. And then you ask them if they want to buy the course. So that's how I would run ads if you were going to run them without doing any of the community stuff. Um, but it would be running it to a very valuable piece of content in exchange for your email. And then coming up with, okay, what are the next five emails I'm going to send to them? to make them feel like we're credible to make them feel like we've given them quite a bit to think about and to, you know, to take away. And then how can we ask them in a way that might get them to say yes. So that works. Wow. No ads from the marketing guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It's actually really interesting because not you and I, we did not spend a penny on ads like with NYB. Like we, we, it was all about building our community, building our credibility through the work that we did by word of mouth. It was all word of mouth, like how we built our business, which is amazing. But the one area that we did spend money on was search engine optimization. And that was definitely interesting. We weren't necessarily getting the clients that we wanted for whatever reason. So we stopped eventually because it just wasn't worth the investment, I feel like, but it did help our Google ranking. So it's like, do we at some point, do we need to be conscious of SEO when we're building our platforms? Like, does that even matter? Like in this no. space that we're working no. with? In your head, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's way too competitive. It's never going to happen. Yeah. You mentioned I, it's too competitive. I have mm -hmm. zero focus. The only thing I'd recommend from an SEO perspective is in the description and in the title of your Facebook group, use the, use keywords in there. So it's like discoverable. But the truth is, um, most the biggest consulting and course programs in the world, 99.9% .9 of them uh, have no ranking whatsoever. It's community based. They started a podcast and gained following. 
people joined the email list to get access to the webinar and then they sold through that. Um, or what I'm seeing now, and this, you know, when we said, you know, the traditional knowledge is to start the email list first, how do you get people to join your email list? You have to give them a really valuable piece of content. How do you do that? How do you get it in front of them? A Facebook group is like a low friction, easy yes way to start it. And because Facebook groups weren't as big as they were until this year, that's probably why. And I think people, as they start to discover them, they're really untapped. There's so few Facebook groups and the, a lot of them out there suck, but I'm a part of a couple that are powerful that I pay a couple hundred dollars a year to be a part of. Uh, and the impact is like, incredible. In fact, just before COVID, we were working on this ad training one and I was actually going to have a paid version of a Facebook group. I was going to launch one where you had to pay to be a part of it. And that was actually going to be a big part of my marketing strategy. Um, obviously we've pivoted a little bit from that, but, um, you know, it's, it's super viable. I know people, um, like for example, ad leaks, which is like a Facebook ad platform. So they've got a big Facebook group of free content and they're like, Hey, if you want access to our team and like better training videos and like real answers, like big answers to big problems, join ad leaks. So just from the two Facebook groups alone, they make half, I, I calculated it to roughly half a million dollars a month from their Facebook group they make. Wow. So like if you can just deliver it in that ecosystem and you can get people to buy into the community and the access, like, you could, you could easily have a seven figure business just as a Facebook group. That's incredible. So it, it's, and it's, I think people, because it's so new and people had their, the, the people that were already successful had their email lists already. So they're like, well, why would I, but I think they're making a mistake. I think they're leaving money on the table because when you have an email list, unless someone opts into a webinar, like they're not, your people aren't communicating with each other. They're not responding to each other chatting. They don't know who the other people in the group are. It's just, I'm at the end of this broadcast, right? A Facebook group is a way for your people to be able to talk to each other and like build relationships and transact. And like, there's this melting pot of awesomeness that lives inside of these groups. And I think people are going to wake up to it in the next 18 months and then Facebook groups are going to be massive. That's amazing. I feel like you're talking about something that's so new and like at the very beginning of something, which is so refreshing in a world where everything's been done a million times. So I love that. That's really great. Um, I want to go back a little bit to when you said to us that your advice would be to do a, a few of these like 45 minute courses on Udemy to capture emails. Um, I don't know. Is that possible? Like, are you able to capture emails on Udemy? Yeah, so when somebody signs up for the course, you get you get their email. Oh, really? Good to know. <laughs> so it's a great, yeah, it's a great lead capture. So it's like, hey, so say for example, say you have a couple of high ticket courses. Say you're like, you know what? If somebody bought this, they feel like it would be $20,000 worth of knowledge. So I'm going to price it at a fifth of that or an eighth of that, right? Say you want it to be a couple thousand bucks for your course it's going to be a really hard sell from like, I have no idea who you are to come get, like you couldn't run an ad to that course. The threat, the pain threshold is too high. I'm not going to spend 3000 when I just saw a Facebook ad, just, even if you had a good sales page, it's not going to happen. Right? So Udemy is an interesting thing where maybe you drive the attention to there because getting their email and moving them into their, your, you know, the community, the Facebook group where you do, you know, a Q and a once a week and you bring in other people to talk about marketing and being a creative and you put your own content in like, getting them on a you know 30 or 45 minute video on in Udemy probably makes a ton of sense so you know uh, intro to storyboarding um how to create you know strategies to create corporate videos that don't suck like there's so many different things you can talk about mm -hmm. and you could make them into 35 minute courses sell them for 10 bucks and just use the lead capture from that uh, from Udemy to move them into the ecosystem that you own so I like that idea. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you so okay. much again for coming on. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, w stay tuned because there might be a Mike Mole episode number two. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.
That's a wrap on another episode of the Course Creation Podcast. Thank you for tuning in and being a champion of ours. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit subscribe and find us on Apple Podcasts to leave us a review. We really want to hear from you. And we're going to be digging through reviews for our next guest to feature. So if you're interested in being a guest, then you know what to do. Also join our private Facebook community called the Course Creation Crew to connect with other course creators. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at coursecreation.com. That is all. We appreciate you all so much and look forward to having you here next time.